Hey guys. Uh, hello. Sophia, I see you're asking if we can hear you and I cannot hear you. Okay, hold on. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right, Suzanne and Neva, can you hear us now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can also hear you. Thumbs up from Suzanne. Okay. Well, I think we're gonna get going. Can you hear me? I have a horrible echo. Can you still hear me? Great. Well, we're going to get going. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah. I am okay. Sophia Yuso. I'm from the uh, EPA um, Indian Environmental General Assistance Program. And we are going to be presenting on climate change activities and peer-to-peer -peer info sharing. We've got quite a packed schedule, um, lots of different presenters from uh, different entities. Uh, so yeah, without further ado. So from EPA Region 9, we have Suzanne Marr, who is joining us virtually. Hi. Please uh, have a little grace. We This is the first time we're doing a virtual presenter in this space. So we're really hoping that Suzanne can join us. But if not, we will go through her portion. Um, and Here. I, I'm Su Sophia Yuso. I'm S Suzanne Marr. Um, I'm Sophia Yuso, and um, Mark, my colleague Mark Rios is also here from the GAP program. Um, Loretta Venegas has joined us from our Clean Water Act program. She'll be talking about some of that funding and climate related progr programming. Um, John Mosley is here from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He'll be speaking about some funding that's coming out of BIA. That's really exciting. Um, and then from the Pala Environmental Department, we have Shasta gone. Um, and I just Shasta today, guys, but she's amazing. So, um, and then from Karuk, uh, we have Neva Givens, and will be Neva. also really <laughs> joining us online. So, uh, <sighs> with that, I'm going to hand it over to Suzanne to start us off with some EPA related information. All right, can you hear me? Can you guys hear us? Can you hear us? Hi, we're here. Can you hear us? You can see Suzanne's face. Look. <laughs> Suzanne, we can see you, your lovely face. <laughs> yes. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think virtually we can hear each other, but maybe they can't in the room. I think you're right. <laughs> <sighs> Okay. And I'm getting a horrible echo. Yeah. Another, but we can't hear them in okay. the room. Um, I think maybe it would be best if we just 
go ahead and present this portion herself. But um, yep. Suzanne is an go ahead. source. Uh, she is the EPA Region 9 lead on climate action. And um, we'll put her, her email address in the chat. I really, really recommend that you reach out to Suzanne if you have any climate related issues or questions uh, within Region 9. She's a wealth of knowledge. Can you hear me now? All right, everyone. So picking up for Suzanne, sorry she couldn't connect online um, for folks here. So um, first off, we're going to move through this quite quickly on the EPA side so we can have um, folks working at the on the tribal side to um, you know um, take up the heart of this presentation. Um, so first off, um, can you put the slides on, please? Um, so we're going to start by looking at the climate um, Regionized Climate Change Adaptation Implementation Plan. Um, and you can find, and the link is available here, and you could also find it online. Um, so we're gonna have a brief in, um, overview of this plan. Um, and it was in 2021 and 2022, um, we held listening sessions and offered consultation on this plan. Um, and we um, also asked headquarters to, um, is asking us to revisit the plan and update it as needed. Um, and also, we always welcome um, feedback from tribal folks on how to improve the plan. So we looked at the U.S. National Climate Assessment and other documents and wrote up this um, vulnerability assessment to focus on EPA's work and to help our EPA co uh, colleagues understand climate impacts um, better. And as you can see here, um, um, yeah, so here are some of the vulnerabilities we have um, in the region. In, in general and also um, in Indian country. And we will re revisit these um, a bit as we go on in our presentation. Um, and also, so here are some of the ways that um, that climate change will um, has, a, has affected um, our EPA programs and also those that are um, happening at the tribal level. And so climate um, impacts make it, make it harder for your environmental department to meet their goals. So. Um, yeah, that first step was in identifying your program's challenges with climate impacts and can help you identify actions as well. And so EPA's number one priority is assisting tribes to address your priorities for climate, climate adaptation. We are always interested to hear how we can do better in assisting tribes to address climate, climate adaptation in all of our programs. And um, regarding funding, there right now there is no climate adaptation specific funding. And so we will um, be revisiting funding um, that it, that you could do climate um, climate adaptation work on. So um, starting off is GAP. Next we will, um, it will be through 319 funding and through BIA and the other sources of funding that um, our tribal folks have utilized. And also, so um, here's, um, just a short list of um, some actions that um, folks have taken um, on, on their tribal lands um, to address the range of climate impacts. And, um, you know, I'm sure that there's lots that we'll be able to talk about later on this presentation when we do the info sharing. And going to bring it back to Sophia to talk about GAP. Pardon me, I'm going to stay over here because I'm also uh, doing the PowerPoints. So, uh, as Mark mentioned, there are, you know, and as we're all aware, we've been we've been talking about a little bit already in this room today. Uh, Region nine, as well as the rest of the world, faces um, unfortunately a plethora of climate-related threats that lead to vulnerabilities, both for our environment and for human health. Um, and so, the first step in climate work and and an action that is fundable through GAP is is doing a vulnerability assessment. And basically, vulnerability assessments are first stage capacity building plans that help you and your tribe understand kind of where where are where do our risks lie? Um, you know, uh, how could we be affected, you know, both in terms of like the actual physical lands um, that we own and reside on, as well as, you know, kind of air, all sorts of other impacts, right? Air during wildfires, um, heat, 
these things that are kind of less um, tangible. Where where are we at risk? How could it, will this affect um, the land that we care about in our communities? And so GAP funds those vulnerability assessments, uh, which are uh, kind of the first step of a process, the second of which is uh, adaptation planning. So GAP also funds adaptation planning and adaptation plans are that next stage where you say, okay, we understand our risks. Now, um, what are we gonna do to protect ourselves, right? What are those next steps? Um, and this list that we have on the screen here is um, taken from ITEP. Um, NAU and ITEP are kind of the leaders in terms of training around uh, climate adaptation um, and climate work in general in the tribal community. Um, and so as you can see, some, some activities that you might list in an adaptation plan are prioritizing vulnerable resources and areas that um, you, know, you most would want to protect in um, the incidents of uh, climate catastrophe, um, kind of thinking through what those adaptation strategies would be, how you would track and measure progress around them, um, and what sort, what types of uh, like integrated approaches, be it on the policy or on the ecosystem level, would you use um, to make those happen? So, GAP funds both vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans. There's also a host of other activities. Um, those are things that kind of feed into those two planning documents, um, but also can be kind of somewhat uh, separate. So attending ITEP trainings or any other trainings that you can find, peer-to-peer -peer sharing between um, your tribe and other tribes or nonprofits, state and uh, federal and local agencies. Um, participating in work groups, test driving programs, Anyone hear me? Um, doing uh, pollution prevention work Hello? like composting, recycling, etc. Um, and you know, when you, when you put those in your work plan, kind of the uh, technical level of you know figuring out which uh, which capacity indicators to use. That's something that your GAP project officer can help you work through, but um, the meat of it is here. This is These are things that you can do to kind of build up um, climate work to the implementation stage. And uh, as I mentioned, John Mosley is here. He can talk a little bit about other funding that you can use to take things to the next level. Um, and to that end, uh, for the summer, our talk, I put together this uh, tribal climate related funding resources uh, spreadsheet. So I did my best to comb through the other federal funding that exists. There's there's funding on a, through EPA, for instance, you probably have heard quite a bit about CPRG, the um, climate, climate Pollution Resources Grant funding. Um, there's a lot of funding through IRA and Bill um, for climate related work, but this is a great place to start. You have to go, unfortunately, to the R9 R Talk uh, guidance documents page and click on it. Um, we, it's not a live link, but it will download. And um, there is a lot of information there about how to find. Uh, implementation funding gap is a capacity building program. So that's the majority of the funding that you will find through our program. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff out there and there are more resources here. This PowerPoint will be um, on our conference page and I really recommend that you look through some of these links. So with that, um, I'm going to pass the mic to Loretta Venegas from our Clean Water Act program, and she will tell you about their funding. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Loretta Venegas. As Sophia said, I'm the acting manager for the Tribal Clean Water section. Welcome. If this is your first co conference, welcome. Hopefully you'll come and take advantage of networking and the other sessions that we have for the rest of the week. Many of you may have these programs already, um, the Clean Water Act 106 and the Clean Water Act 319. So this is probably uh, just a reminder and just to let you know that the, these funding sources are available for you to use um, to support any related climate change activities and we'll give some examples. 
just to start off um, with the Clean Water Act Section 106, just basic information of the um, Clean Water Act Section 106 um, is for uh, financial assistance for water pollution type um, activities. If you can go back to the next slide, please. Um, and in last year, we revised our Clean Water Act Section 106 guidance. Many of you may have that already. Um, and we're going to have a session later this afternoon that would go more into detail of what the 106 program is. And then in 1987, um, the uh, Congress enacted a change to include um, funding available for tribes as well. So you have to go, you have to become eligible for the 106. Um, so like I said, many of you probably have the program, the 106 and 319, so you have gone through this process. Um, a few activities for the 106 is uh, obviously the water quality monitoring aspect is very large. Um, you can use the funding in your grants to support quality assurance plans. If you are um, dealing with HABs, harmful algal blooms, you can develop a quality assurance plan or a sampling plan to address that. Um, you can also uh, develop a drought contingency plan. In droughts in California, this past year we did have water, but it's good to be prepared. Um, you can use your 106 funding to support a drought contingency plan. Um, and as I mentioned, um, HABs monitoring is becoming more active, so you can develop a SAP for that if it's going to be a one-time, or if it's continuous, you can do a quality assurance and include that in your quality assurance plans that you have. Education and outreach, you want to um, provide that education and outreach for the communities. You can work with the schools. The 106 funding can support that, those type of activity, activities as well. Newsletters, educational videos, field trips, um, Earth Day activities. Training and travel, you're here at the conference today, you know, using the 106 funding to support that. Um, other trainings that um, you may be aware of, you can contact your project officer and if you're interested in the training, if it's related to climate change or water quality, uh, the 106 funding can support that as well. And as I, as I mentioned, um, with 106, you can support many of the climate change activities, drought, um, flooding, wildfire. Um, those are different type of activities you can support. Um, we heard about this earlier today, if you were in that session for the water uh, quality exchange under the 106 program, there are reporting requirements. You can include, if you are monitoring for HABs, you can include that as part of the data that's being submitted as well. And next slide, please. The next program is the Clean Water Act 319. That's your non-point source. Um, program. You can also utilize some of this funding. You can get creative and um, support many of those climate change activities as well. Oops. Jumped around. I think it was number 20. More down. There we go. Thank you. Um, this past year, under your Clean Water Act 319, there was a jump. There was an increase in the base funding. Um, between 45,000 and 70,000. Um, it normally used to be 30,000 and hopefully that will continue in future years. Um, there's a competitive 319 program and that's aside from your base. So you have your base every year. And then if you have a larger project that you want to apply for, there's a competitive, which can be up to $125,000. Um, the request for proposals for these programs usually come out in early spring, so around February of next year. Um, you should see the proposal, the request for proposals. If you don't have either the 319 or 106, if it's your first time your tribe does not have these programs, you can come see me after the session, or like I said, later this afternoon, we're having a more detailed sessions on the program. Oh, can you go back one? Thank you. Um, some of the activities, just to give you an idea of what can be used under 319 to monitor those non-point source pollutants that may be causing the harmful algal blooms, the HABs. You can do um, restoration of riparian, wetland restoration, exclusion, fencing, watershed planning, outreach and education. You can also do training, and then wildfire mitigation as well. 
Um, Amaya Simpson later uh, tomorrow, actually, will be giving a presentation specifically on how Clean Water Act 319 funding was used to support wildfire mitigation activities. Um, there's flooding as well. So there's all different type of activities that you can use your funding for. Um, what's required, if you do have the 319 program, you have this document already, which is the non-point source assessment report plan. Um, let's see, for, um, to become eligible for the 106 and 319 programs, uh, you must be a federally recognized tribe, have a governing body capable of managing your program. So if you have a GAP program, you're eligible if you don't have this program yet. And jurisdiction authority over water resources. Um, so those are the requirements. And if you have any questions, we, in our section, um, Kate Pinkerton and Kelly Williams are actually here at the conference today and will, will be presenting later. There are Clean Water Act 106 co-leads. And then for the Clean Water Act 319 program, it's Howard Kahn and Larry Morin. And like I said, if you have any questions, you can come uh, talk to me after today. Thank you. And next we have BIA. Hi everyone, I'm John Mosley with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, I just became the branch chief for the Tribal Climate Resilience Program in April and here to talk about our funding opportunities. Um, if I want to present on our program, I distill it to two different um, purposes, which is technical assistance and then financial assistance. So those are the two takeaways. Um, for technical assistance, um, we focus on access to science, um, education, training, so we fund travel, those kinds of things. Um, we have a regional network of liaisons that we provide funding for, and those liaisons, I'll talk about them later, are there to also support tribes and provide technical assistance. And then we just hired um, regional tribal climate resilience coordinators and those coordinators are there to work in region or with the region offices in BIA and also be a point of contact for tribes about our program and provide any technical assistance on our funding. Um, for financial assistance, um, you may be aware of our annual awards program. Um, this year we had 120 million available. Um, we got funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction act. So that also helped to fund uh, some community relocation projects that were targeted to specific tribes, including the Havasupai tribe in region nine, or yeah, region nine, and the Yurok tribe. Next. So our coordinators, their contact information is there, or their names are there. I'll get the, their contact information later. Um, but they're cover, some of them cover more than one region. Um, we have two for Alaska, but, um, one is not hired yet. And for um, Region 9, um, your contact for the Pacific region is Alicia Flores. And for the rest of the region, um, Shana Tallis. Um, so we, like I said, we also um, fund liaisons and they partner with the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Centers. And they do a lot of different, they serve a lot of different roles, but um, there to provide technical assistance, um, help tribes access any kind of information, and they do that in coordination with USGS in their science centers um, to gain access to better science. Um, so I talked about our annual awards program um, for this year in the RFP already closed, um, but we had two categories of funding, two main categories, one for planning. We also fund vulnerability assessments and adaptation planning or other planning um, that supports um, tribes through self-determination with a $250,000 max per award. And then for implementation and that'd be implementing activities related to your adaptation plans or addressing the vulnerabilities in your vulnerability assessments. Um, we opened up implementation last year due to the influx of bill and IRA funding that we received. And I know that's for me coming from working for a tribe, having access to implementation funding is a big deal. 
Next slide. We also had some set-asides. So first time awardee set-aside, and that's for if you haven't applied from funding from us for any kind of planning, um, you get your foot in the door and access um, over other so, um, non-competitively, I guess, for um, getting a planning document or planning award. Um, we had a habitat restoration set aside this year in that's to do to various different types of habitat restoration. It could be related to emergencies or, you know, wildland fires um, or whatever projects that we're open to the projects that could be proposed. Um, there was no max for that category, um, but we did only have 34 million available. And then the last is for relocation, manage retreat and protect in place a coordinator. So that would be to hire a, a person for up to three years at $150,000 a year. So a total of $450,000 to work on RMP type activities. And that's if um, tribes are faced with uh, difficult decisions around um, relocation, protect in place or um, manage retreat. Um, on our website, um, we have examples of all of our previous awards. We have summaries available. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website and um, take a look if you want some ideas of what's been funded and done in the past. Um, I also wanted to plug our unmet needs report. We're working on a, a report that's a congressional mandate, but um, in order to look at unmet needs, especially on coastal tribes, and we're, we go back and forth about what is a coastal tribe, and uh, we have a methodology in place to try to identify those, but also we're accepting input from those that identify as coastal. Um, Colleen Cooley is, from ITEP is our main point of contact there, um, and we are accepting input right now. Um, so I encourage you to, if you're a coastal, coastal tribe or identify as coastal to um, provide input on any unmet needs. Um, and that is all I have. Thank you. And there is a QR code there for um, my, our, our website if you wanted to do a quick gander. But the links will also be available in the presentation. Hey everybody, wake the heck up. It's after lunch, I know we're all tired. Um, I'm here under duress. How many of you have seen the movie Clerks? You know how Dante is always like, I wasn't even supposed to be here. That's me right now. I'm supposed to be Heidi Brow, my water resources specialist and environmental coordinator, but Heidi got double booked. She's downstairs doing a tribal beneficial uses session. So she said, Shasta, will you do this? And if you know me, you know you give me a microphone, I'm in my happy place. So here I am to talk about climate change work on the Paula Reservation, where I work. For those who don't know me, Shasta Gon, Environmental Director and Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Paula Band of Mission Indians going on 19 years now. Next slide, please. So Heidi made this presentation, I have no idea what's in it. Uh, let's just take it one slide at a time. But I know we only have so much time before I have to give the microphone over to Neva, if we can hopefully hear her. We'll see what happens. Um, but just a little bit about Paula. Um, Heidi made this very water heavy, which I know nothing about because that's her job, but I'll do my best to talk about it. Uh, we have about 1,300 people living in Paula. That includes tribal members, tribal descendants, and uh, people who are not tribal, uh, they might be renting um, or living with family. Uh, we have a land base of approximately 16,000 acres that is both trust and fee land. Most of it is contiguous, um, but we do have some parcels that are not connected to the main Paula Reservation. Groundwater is our sole water source. Um, we are in arid Mediterranean climate. We're about 50 miles north of where we are sitting right now, um, so a very similar climate. Um, and uh, the San Luis Rey River um, allegedly runs through the center of the reservation. There is very rarely surface flow in that river, but there is an underground stream. So our sole source of water is groundwater. What the heck does that have to do with climate change? A lot. Drought, heat, um, water pollution, um, non-point source pollution and source pollution. So lots of things connected to our climate change work. Next. So 
Heidi had a QR code, I guess, because she has an, another presentation she did on this, because if you're like her, you spend your time looking at other people's old presentations. So go ahead and look at that. That's a laugh line, you guys. You can laugh. Ha ha ha. You're not laughing. It's a tough crowd. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me a courtesy chuckle over there. Um, so Heidi has uh, some additional resources that you can look at to um, hear more about our non-point source work in Paula. Um, I'm very lucky to have her uh, so that she can take care of these um, very important things for us. Next. All right, so what are we dealing with when we're talking about climate change um, in our particular region? If we look at it from a water perspective, we're looking at the watershed. So we have 562 square miles in the San Luis Rey watershed. Um, in this map here, Paula is right up there um, in the center of the watershed. And we are not the only tribe who is within that watershed. There's Palma, Rincon, um, John, are you in that watershed? Yeah, San Pasqual, um, La Jolla, Los Coyotes, Mesa Grande, Santa Isabel. Um, and so did I miss anyone? Rincon. Yeah, so lots of tribes. Um, we try to work one, uh, with one another um, for the same purposes, to protect our water systems and to work on climate change issues. Like I said, we don't have much water. The water uh, in the river still runs where it goes through La Jolla, but uh, over a century ago, a dam was built, created the Lake Henshaw Reservoir, and that water was diverted to uh, the cities of Escondido and Vista. So there is a lack of water, even though there's been a water settlement to get that water back to the tribes. It's paper water. It's not actual water that you can use. We don't get much precipitation. And we have an interesting range from sea level all the way up to 6,535 feet in this watershed. So a lot of things to consider when it comes to our climate work. Um, and especially with water, we know that as drought problems increase, then our issues of concern become greater in terms of bacteria, nutrients, salinity, um, you know, our septic systems, all of those things become issues that we want to deal with in our climate planning when it comes to water, as well as many other things. Next. So for our climate planning, um, we have done a lot of vulnerability studies and assessments, and we have a climate plan that was finalized in 2017, I want to say. So it's at the point where we're about to start revising that climate adaptation plan. Um, I will thank uh, Mr. John Mosley in advance for approving our application to redo our climate plan. Thanks, John. You're awesome. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people probably applied for that money. We hope to um, do updates on our climate adaptation plan. If you haven't done one, you need to start with your vulnerability study, and that's what we did. We worked with our community to find out what their concerns were, and that's really important because if I hadn't talked to our community members, I would have made assumptions about their concerns that turned out to be wrong. The things they were worried about were not the things I expected them to be worried about. So work with your community, find out what they are most concerned about. And then of course, over time, the reason you want to revisit your vulnerabilities and uh, revise your adaptation plan is because your vulnerabilities may change. We just found out in the last month or so that we have a positive identification of gold spotted oak borer on the Paula reservation. You know, if you're familiar with GSOB, you know that that's uh, a big deal um, and very potentially uh, detrimental to our oak woodlands. So that's a new vulnerability. We knew it could happen. Now we know that it is happening. So we can uh, wrap that into our climate adaptation plan. Uh, we also have a pre-disaster mitigation plan with funding from FEMA. And then we have a lot of great partnerships, uh, such as with the Climate Science Alliance. So if there are organizations in your area that do work with tribes beyond your usual agency partners, it's a good idea to try to get those partnerships in place, um, especially if there's access to data that you can use to inform your planning um, and your vulnerability assessments. Next, please. So another thing we have that is actually uh, due almost entirely to tribal climate resilience funding from the BIA is the Tribal Climate Health Project. This graphic on the right is from that work where we do this kind of climate work, not just for Paula, but for other tribes. We provide trainings and resources, webinars and summits 
so that we can help other tribes benefit from what we have learned through doing our own adaptation planning process in Paula. What we found in ours, which we used as a template to help other people, template, 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 template. Maybe I want dinner. I need a template of dinner. Um, we have our biggest concerns are high temperatures, wildfire, drought, storms, and flooding. Um, in the graphic on the farthest right, it also has melting ice and sea level rise. Not an issue for Paula, but might be an issue for some of the other tribes in Region 9, especially our coastal tribes with, uh, with sea level rise. So we uh, came up with some plans for what were the best ways to mitigate some of those climate impacts. Next slide. So this graphic on the right actually comes from the Climate Science Alliance and the Connecting Wildlands and Communities project that we participated in. Um, but it's a good example of some of the connections or the planning issues that we wanted to integrate into our own climate planning. Um, when it comes to fire, water, biodiversity, et cetera, um, there are lots of different things that are affected and that you have to consider. Uh, and if, as much as possible, we wanted to take that nature-based solutions approach where we were not working against nature, but rather working with it. And to the degree that we can to be reintroducing um, tribal ways of knowing and living upon the land that we know are healthier and better um, if they are allowed to resume. Um, but that includes lots of social challenges and economic challenges. Uh, it's not necessarily that easy to resume some of those practices and activities. Um, there, there can be uh, social and economic barriers to achieving those things, but we're doing the best we can with some of the things that seem to be more palatable to people, such as a green roof or rain gardens and rainwater harvesting. People seem to really enjoy the uh, kind of the challenge of being able to say, look, I actually collected 50 gallons of rainwater in the most recent storm, and I was able to use it to water my garden or to make it a point of pride to say that you've removed your lawn and replaced it with native plants. So those are the things that people are, are willing to do uh, on their own. And then we have bigger projects as well, like installing solar microgrids, um, plans for other larger infrastructure style projects to help protect our community from climate and climate effects. Next. Oh my God, Heidi. Okay, so this is going to be in her next performance evaluation. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> this is an example of a slide that has too much going on, so I don't even know what's going on in here, so we're going to skip it. Move on. <laughs> Those were actually snippets from our climate adaptation plan. Um, I actually don't even like using slides just because I think they're distracting, but, you know, you got to have something for people to look at. So a couple more things that we did on non-point source work specifically. Um, we had a project to do a flood barrier on Trujillo Creek. Uh, there was uh, rain events when we have them tend to be very heavy rains. And so there were flooding issues where some neighborhoods were getting washed out. And it's it was funny, but not so funny that we have a video of one of our young tribal residents paddling a kayak down his flooded street. And it was kind of funny, like, ha, huh, he's paddling a kayak down his street. And then it was not funny because, oops, we were supposed to do something to prevent that. So not so great. Uh, unfortunately, FEMA sucks, and we haven't actually gotten the money released yet to do that project. And in the meantime, that neighborhood has flooded two more times. FEMA is my least favorite agency. Who's with me? Couple people. Okay. Close second, Army Corps of Engineers. Sorry, sorry if there's any of you here from that. I don't blame you personally. Um, but uh, that is one project. We also are working on revegetation of some of that creek so that it does reduce the um, erosive power of floodwaters when they do occur. Um, lots and lots of habitat restoration has been one of the best ways for us to manage our waterways, both for climate change, drought, and uh, flooding and pollution. Next. Okay, funding sources. We heard about those from our friends at EPA and BIA. There's also FEMA. Boo. And then um, we got some money from the National Indian Health Board, which was a pass through from the um, Centers for Disease Control. So there's lots of different places to find funding. Um, if you want to find these uh, sources yourself, some of them are linked. The presentation is available through Excel events. And I think we have one more slide. Yeah, more, more resources. And again, um, I will highlight again that partnerships with local 
agencies as well as with your community agencies or community groups, I should say, like the Climate Science Alliance and your universities are helpful. Um, if you're interested in working with universities and want to know how to do it without getting all your data stolen, come to my presentation tomorrow at 11 o'clock on tribal data sovereignty. Um, and then I think the next one is just our, yes, thank you, and Heidi's contact information. So my name is Heidi Brow. Thank you very much. <laughs> my name is Shastagon. I think I'm on the next slide. Um, if you want to, no, I'm not. If you want to reach out to uh, to either of us, um, feel free to do so. And I'm going to turn it over to my friend from Karuk. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to try to get Neva up uh, into the audio. And if we can't, we're going to skip ahead to Q&A. OK, can you hear me? So give us a couple minutes okay. to navigate the audio. Let me know. I'll keep talking to see if I turn up. <laughs> Hello. Maybe during time we could start answering a couple questions. Does that sound good to people? Woo. OK. We've got some guiding questions here. Oh. Hello. All right. So yeah, this section is for folks who um, have done climate change work. And thank you, Shasta, for sharing your experience um, doing climate change work. Um, and those for who are contemplating climate change work. So I'm going to open this up to the crowd. Um, you know, these you don't have to use these questions. Anything that comes to mind, um, please feel free. Um, you know, I think our great greatest resources each other here. So um, yeah. If you have questions about funding, because we talked a little bit about EPA funding and BIA funding. Can you hear me? So John. <laughs> when will the BIA be uh, released? Actually, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you applied for BIA tribal climate resilience funding this this round? Anybody? TCR funding? Okay. Just a just a couple. Um oh you get your own microphone. How many knew about it? Well, yeah. I think the better question is how many didn't. Uh oh. Well, good. The we fewer people apply, the more money for me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, we want there to be as much money as possible. Um, people, but uh, I, I know that you and I exchanged multiple emails where I had some confusion over the way the money is distributed to tribes, and that if you have a project that involves more than one tribe, the need to get tribal resolutions from every tribe who is a potential partner in that project. And that was a little troubling for us because we tend to, through the Tribal Climate Health Project, provide training to um, sometimes you know, 30 or 40 or 50 different tribes nationwide. And so we need to get a resolution from each of those tribes. And I think that's important for people to understand if you would like to just repeat what I just said. Well, so we fund, we, we pass through our funding through Public Law 93638, which is in the Indian Self-Determination Act. And through that act, um, it allows tribes to carry on responsibilities of the federal government, program services and activities, and mainly from BIA, um, as if they were the federal government. So in Shasta's um, conundrum, when you provide when a tribe is providing training on behalf of the BIA, PIA has to have provided that training before to measure um, success and um, to know that they're doing it successfully. If we do not provide such training, um, it puts us in a legal conundrum because um, a, a, a partner tribe could say, well, we didn't provide the training as well as BIA could have, and I don't know, there's legal issues involved. Um, so that's why resolutions from each partnering tribe are required for training. Getting, usually training is carried out through tribal consortia. Um, Inter-tribal consortia do carry resolutions from partnering tribes to provide training to other tribes. And in that context, mm -hmm. there's not issues. Um, so it's kind of a technical technical thing. Hello, but can you hear me? I will say that by providing funding through 638, um, there's less requirements on reporting. Um, it's not like the financial assistance grants. And 
the money loses its federal character according to the law and is um, able to be used for um, a match on other grants. So maybe FEMA's match requirements or um, Can you hear me? Clean Water Act match requirements that might be needed to satisfy those grants. So that is a, uh, that is a benefit, but I think mostly we honor Indian self-determination, meaning um, we, you decide how you need to run that grant funded program. And we are respective of so tribal sovereignty and self-determination. Hello, can you hear me? No, I don't think you can hear me. <laughs> we can hear you, Heidi, and you, or I'm sorry, maybe we, you have about three minutes, so <laughs> the quickest overview. Okay, <laughs> climate change work at the Cudduck Drive. So I'm Neva Gibbons. I'm the Deputy Director of Natural Resources here at the Cudduck Tribe. Um, and hopefully we can jump into my slides here. Somewhere. <laughs> um, we have a climate adaptation plan that was approved in 2019. That is kind of where our, all of our planning and implementation is based on at this point. Um, we are currently growing quite a bit and trying to expand throughout Kaduk Aboriginal Territory, which is over a million acres, um, much of which is currently administered by the Forest Service. Um, so we do a lot of work with them, um, but take it on ourselves as the Indigenous people to this place to steward and care for all of this over a million acres um, through our programs. Um, so a big piece of that is using cultural burning to care for the land and our natural and cultural resources. Um, so this photo here shows our Cudduck Women's Treks participants from last year, which was a really exciting new program that we began um, to bring Indigenous women together to practice and learn about prescribed fire. Um, and we had a couple of really amazing burns that we had that we did here near Orleans, California, where I'm at, um, that had wonderful fire effects benefiting hazel, acorns, um, a lot of different traditional food sources and basket weaving sources. Um, and we hope to continue with this program in the future. Um, in order to be able to build up our programs to meet the needs of our large land base here, um, we are trying to staff up, but that also means we need more space. So that's a big project that we're working on right now is how can we meet the need of such a large space with our small staff? Um, and what strategic ways can we grow to make sure that um, we, it says we're ending the session, <laughs> to make sure that we, um, oh, to make sure that we have the space for everybody, not only to work, but also to live um, and be resilient in this rural place that is threatened by things like catastrophic wildfire that is the result of a lack of cultural and prescribed burn. Um, so I'm afraid I might be out of time. Can anyone tell me? <laughs> Yep, we are out of time, unfortunately. So sorry for all the technical difficulties, but thank you guys for holding tight. And let's hear it for our great presenters. Um, we know we had to run through things really quickly. So if you see Mark, myself, Shasta, Loretta, um,